Well, good evening, everyone. So before I get started with the presentation, I want to talk to you about another organization that is here in the Colorado Springs area. Well, it's a really a national organization, but um, they're really trying to get more information out uh, in regard to the services that they provide. Anybody heard of this organization? Crime Stoppers. You probably see maybe commercials on TV or you might see billboards around town or whatever. Um, but it's really a, now many schools have uh, safe to tell, uh, which is an opportunity if a student sees something or wants to report something at school, they can utilize safe to tell. Uh, but Crime Stoppers is something that can be done in the community. So if you see a crime or witness a situation, you can report it and it's all anonymous. So they don't, um, it won't be tracked back to you or anything of that nature. And then individuals that um, help to solve a crime, they have the ability to earn money from it because uh, if a crime has been reported and it has been solved, uh, then there is sometimes rewards for those who help with that. And as we know, there are tons and tons of crimes that are happening all around our city. And your ability to help stop crime is to use Crime Stoppers. And that way you don't have to feel as though you're tattling on somebody and they're gonna know that you did. Uh, because it is all anonymous. And so um, just want to make you aware of it. They're really trying to get more and more individuals. So I do have some bags and I think some magnets uh, for it. But if you just write down 719-634-STOP. Uh, and if you notice a crime or a situation that has occurred. This morning I was on my way to Aurora at 6 o'clock. And police cars were everywhere in my neighborhood. Why? Because at two o'clock in the morning, there was a hit and run. And somebody died uh, as part of that hit and run. So that happened at two in the morning. I was leaving at six and they were still cop cars all over the place. So whoever did that, now somebody's life, is gone and whoever did it is gone to a degree as well until they can find them. So when those types of situations happen, we want to just make sure if possible to report uh, those situations. Okay, so 719-634-STOP. So I'm near commercial tonight. All right. Well, thank you for being here tonight. And if I could get the uh, parent coordinators to come up for a second. I want to start off this this particular topic is a is a topic that I enjoy and you do have a handout you do have the slides I'm not going to read to you tonight but um, I am going to go over just a, a number of things in regard to how we can better uh, manage ourselves as well as uh, our time and when I think about uh, managing ourselves and, and becoming more organized, uh, how many of us have a little stress in our lives? <laughs> well, sometimes that stress comes about because we're not organized and we get overwhelmed with stuff, whether it be physical stuff, mental stuff, emotional stuff, and our ability to be able to manage that uh, would be extremely beneficial. Um, so I'm going to have them to pass out this sheet. Do not look at it until I tell you to. Okay. So turn it upside down when you receive it. Don't look at it until I tell you to turn it over. And then we're going to have a little competition. So everybody gets a sheet. Everybody gets a sheet. So one per person.
Do you guys have three sheets on that table? Oh, we need one more. Everybody's got to have a sheet. It's a fun exercise, even for the, for the youngins. So Melissa, can you put, um, can you put 90 seconds? No, 60 seconds. Does, does everybody have a sheet? Are we ready? All right, so go ahead and turn the sheet over and your goal is to see how quickly you can count to 100 in order. One, two, three, four. You don't have to mark anything. You can if you want, but you've got 60 seconds. Please begin. All right, let's stop. How many of you got at least to number five? Yay. How many of you got to 10? 20? 30? 40? How far? 41. 41, anybody higher than 41? Now some of you are probably saying, how the heck, how many? Oh, she got four, okay. She was in the fours, that's good. You got seven, awesome. Woo, that thing is loud. Okay, how did you get to 41? No, but what, did you have a pattern? Did you have a format? Did you? Okay, anybody have a pattern? What was the pattern? Okay, so you cheated. <laughs> All right, so what I want you to do is now I want you to take the paper and I want you to fold it into a fourth. Okay, so you have the lines in between the, the four sections. Okay, everybody done that? So we're gonna give you a minute again, and now we wanna see how far you can get by looking at the four quadrants. You can't do it. Okay, please begin. Start at one again. Make sure you find the number though.
All right. How do we do this time? Much better. How many of you got like to at least 30? 40? 50? Nobody higher than 50? Okay. Was it easier this time? Yeah. You knew where to look. You knew where to focus. And that's really what we're going to talk about tonight is that sometimes our ability to organize is that we've got to begin to look at what are some of our current habits, good or bad, <laughs> how do we prioritize, because sometimes we've got so much stuff and we don't put it into any order, and therefore we're just all over the place. How many of you sometimes will start working on something and then all of a sudden a little squirrel will go by and then you start on something else and another squirrel will come and you say, oh yeah, I'll go back to this. And by the time you finish, you really haven't finished anything. But you got a lot of, you got a lot of squirrels. You met a lot of squirrels in that process. And the other piece is our ability to, how do we resist procrastination? And that's hard. Sometimes it's you just gotta, you just gotta do it. You just gotta uh, make sure you do it. But the biggest piece, I think, in terms of thinking about organizing is removing the clutter. Anybody got stuff that they haven't looked at in two years, five years? Some of us, 20 years. How many of us still have outfits that we haven't worn in the last 10 years, but we keep saying, I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm going to. We don't really know what we're going to, but we're gonna do something. Or we have boxes of stuff. How many of us have storage sheds full of stuff that we probably have no plans of ever utilizing any of it? But we pay for them storage sheds. And we just keep stuff, and we keep stuff, and we keep stuff, and we say, one day I'm going to straighten this out. So when we begin to think about our ability to get organized, we've got to create a plan. When you can't seem to get a handle on your daily schedule, whether it's school or work or just stuff and a time frame, You've got to look at, is this necessary? Do I need to keep any of this? Do I need to focus on any of this? And sometimes it's daunting because there's so much. You go in the basement and you say, okay, I'm going to start here. And then all of a sudden you say, oh, that's so precious. I'll do it later. And precious gets to stay for another year, <laughs> okay? So we gotta figure out how to let go of precious and give it to somebody who can use it or give it to an organization who's gonna sell it to somebody else, but then it's not in your space, but learn how to let it go. So one of the things we wanna look at is, one, we wanna make a calendar and a time to clean. So just like you make a calendar of appointments that you have and all of that, you wanna do the same thing around organizing your space, organizing your desk, organizing your room, organizing your garage, your storage shed or whatever. You wanna set a time to actually do it. And it's not hard to do that. Now, I always say is do it in small chunks because a lot of times we have big projects. There's not enough time in the day to really do it, and therefore we never get to it. So if you just say, I'm going to spend 15 minutes on this. So every Saturday, I'm going to spend 15 minutes going through a section of whatever it is, your garage, your closet, your storage share, whatever it might be. 
Divide the areas that need to be conquered. If you've got things that are precious to you and you don't want to get rid of them, put those aside because you know it's going to take you longer to really focus on it. But if you've got things that are, my mom tells me all the time, your dad has all these, these um, uh, pieces of equipment that don't even work in the garage. But he won't get rid of it because he says, well, he might need it. He might need a part of it. Well, he's not even doing it anymore. He's not mowing the grass anymore. Somebody else mows it. So I don't think he needs part of a lawnmower. But he won't let it go. So when I go visit them, I just load up stuff and just disappear. <laughs> and then he gets mad, but then I leave and come back to Colorado, so it will just be bad at my mom, so. <laughs> Make a list of your task. What is it that we want to do? So if you say, we really want to clean the garage. How many of you, your cars don't fit in your garage? That's, that's crazy. That's what a garage is for. It's for cars, not for boxes, not for stuff. So if your car won't fit in the garage, that's your starting point. I want to make sure my car can fit in the garage. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to clean up that section, okay? And then decide where things are going to go beforehand. So I'm going to give this to my neighbor. I'm going to give this to my siblings. I'm going to give this to Goodwill or the Ark or whatever. And then I'm going to give this to Mr. Garbage because I'm quite sure all of us have stuff that just needs to be thrown away. It's broke, it doesn't work, it's not an antique, although we claim lots of things as antiques. It's not an antique, and nobody's gonna give you any money for it. So a consignment shop is not gonna pay you for that item, so get rid of it. All right, so you don't have to keep everything. So one of the things that I do is every year I transition my clothes. So if I haven't worn something for two years, it disappears. I, I get rid of it. So I go through at least two cycles, two summer cycles, two fall cycles, two winter cycles. And if I haven't worn it within those two cycles, then it moves out because evidently I have no interest in it any longer. I probably can't fit it anyway. My children don't want it. It's not something I want to keep for grandchildren whenever I might have them. So therefore, it goes out. So you've got to create to determine, am I going to use this in the future? And in many cases, clutter, we don't. So every box that I have in my house, I know what's in it. And unless it's a, a keepsake, if I haven't opened it in three years, I don't. I just toss it. I get rid of it. Because if I haven't looked at it in three years and I know it's not a keepsake, then it's probably not something that I really want to keep anyway. People are scared to do that. I'm not. I just take the box and I just dump it in the trash. I don't even open it because when you open it, what happens? <gasps> oh, precious. <laughs> Need to keep you another three years. <laughs> so you gotta, you've got to know that if you've not looked at it in three years and it's not something that you've labeled as sentimental pictures or something like that, then you probably are never going to use it. When was the last time I needed it? And if I keep this, is it gonna be organized? So three boxes, items to keep, items to donate, and then trash. Items to keep, items to donate, and then trash. So you wanna look at, these are the things we wanna keep. So my girls moved out finally, woo! And they've got their own place, so I had a keepsake box for each of them. 
And when they left, I gave them their keepsake box. And I said, you can do whatever you want to do with it. But this is stuff I kept since you were born and stuff that you probably don't want to keep anyway. But here's your box. So they both said, well, can we just leave it at your house? No. <laughs> it is yours to keep or to whatever you want to do with it. Uh, so I, <laughs> I went to their apartment because they moved in together. And I went to their apartment and... Um, my one daughter has her keepsake box under her bed. The other one's like, well, it won't fit under there. I said, well, then go through it and decide what you want to keep. No, I want to keep it all. I said, but it won't fit anywhere. So you're going to leave it in the middle of the floor? Well, I'll figure out what to, I'll get it, maybe a smaller box. I said, well, you don't even know if you want to keep the stuff in it. I'm still going to keep it all. Whatever. It ain't in my house. I don't care what you do with it. Okay. But the idea is that items to keep, items to donate. How many of you are afraid to get rid of stuff? How many of you kind of OCD, pack rats, all of that? <laughs> you, <laughs> you raising your mom's hand? <laughs> okay. Invite me over. I'll get rid of it for you. I'm really good at, at organizing people's space. And I'll help you get rid of it or donate it to other people. So this last one is a place for everything and everything is in its place. So I'm one, I don't like clutter. And so I will look at a room and say, hmm, what's in here that really doesn't need to be in here? Or what's in here that's really in the way? Or what's in here that serves absolutely no purpose? And I like stuff. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a minimalist by any means, but I just don't like clutter. I don't like to walk through stuff and I got to sit at the table, but I got to move everything off the table to be able to actually sit at the table. Mm -mm. Something's got to go. Something's got to get out of the way. How many of you keep magazines and newspapers and all of that? Are you trying to keep up with like things that happened 10 years ago and you don't want to miss out on it? I bet you can find it on the internet. <laughs> think about that. I think you should keep those boxes for senior citizens. <laughs> yes, yes, and, and we keep stuff, but now the internet has it all. Everything that we've ever wanted to know is on the internet. So for those of us that are old school, we don't have to keep all that stuff now because it's all on the internet. We can let it go. All right. So I want you to think about this piece here. Urgent and important. Important, but not urgent. So I'm going to have you turn in that handout, the other handout that, that you have a copy of. And you're going to see this diagram in there in that handout. So when we think about things that are that are urgent and important. What comes up to mind? What comes to mind for you? Things that are urgent and important absolutely have to be done. Yes. She's screaming because. She see, <laughs> that might be urgent. I don't know if it's important, but, <laughs> but it is urgent. But what things are urgent and important? That is urgent and important. Okay. That's something that absolutely needs to be addressed immediate, immediately. You know, so when you talk about uh, deadlines or you talk about sometimes meetings are urgent and important because if I have a doctor's appointment, that's, I got it on the calendar and these days you don't cancel them. So they're urgent and they are important. So things of that nature. But what are things that are urgent but not important?
urgent but not important. How about organizing? <laughs> it is urgent, but it's not important. Goal setting is urgent, but not important. Because a lot of times when we don't goal set, what happens? Things don't get done. So we have a goal to do X, but you don't ever set any priority around it. So it never happens. So when we think about eliminating clutter, managing our time, which we'll talk more about in a minute, is they're urgent, but sometimes they're not considered to be as important. What things are urgent and sometimes not important, but we might consider them to be important? Email. Emails. They're urgent, but they're not always um, important. Oh, I meant the one that was goal setting, I'm sorry, which is not urgent, but important, our goal setting and uh, managing our time and so forth. Um, voicemails, phone calls, they're urgent because they ring or they beep at us or whatever, but they're not always important, are they? And then how about the ones that are not urgent and not important? Say it louder. Having a snack. Having a snack? Well, <laughs> if you're hungry, but in some cases you're right. It's not, not urgent and probably not important, but sometimes Well, I don't know about that now. That's kind of important and urgent for me, but. <laughs> but sometimes trivia things. How many of us do a lot of scrolling on the internet? And then it's 30 minutes later. And what have you learned? Nothing, but we're still doing it. Fun stuff on it, but trivia stuff a lot of times. Not urgent, but I can guarantee you that you probably do that before you will do some of the things that are important that need to be done. Well, then that's what we're going to talk about is that creating a plan, having some goals, therefore things get done. So 80-20 rule. Tell me what you think that means. 80-20 rule. 20% of the work would be 80% of the results. Okay. All right. That's a way to look at it. Absolutely. What else? So the piece here is that we want to look at the need to focus on what is important to us. So a lot of times it's that 20%, but sometimes we spend more time on the, the 80%. That's not important. And it's the same time, same thing for those who, who manage other people. We spend 20% on the people who don't follow the rules or I'm sorry, we spend 80% on the people who don't follow the rules and 20% on those who are doing what they need to do. So therefore I'm exhausting all of my energy with the 80% instead of the 20% that are focused. So that's what we wanna to begin to look at is, are we focusing our energy on the things that are most important or are we focusing our energy on the things that are not? And how do we begin to shift our thinking, shift our mindset to do that? So, how many of you use a paper calendar? 
Okay. Um, electronic calendars, combination of both. Okay. So why sometimes is a paper calendar a good thing? Yeah. If you write it down, you can remember it, but even more so you can visually see it. When we do electronic calendars, not that they're not good for us, but a lot of times we've got so much stuff on that calendar, it's not as visual as having a paper calendar. So you can have both. You don't have to have a large one, but to have a paper calendar allows you to write things down, allows you to cross things off. So even if I cross them off, they're still there so I can still see them. I can still uh, respond to them if I need to. With electronic calendars, when we take stuff off, they're gone. There's no way to go back and, and see what it was that I thought I wanted to do or I thought I needed to focus on, okay? Both work and personal. So for our students, how many of you have calendars? Okay. All right. You have the school, most schools provide calendars for students. So on your calendars, you want to look at putting everything in it. Everything. That means your appointments. That means your assignments. That means when you have tests, when you, if you're in clubs, uh, if you are um, involved in student government or whatever the case may be, you want everything in your calendar. And the reason is that you don't want to be asking your parents at the last minute, I forgot that I've got this big paper that's due and I need all of these supplies and it is 10 o'clock at night. Any, any parents have students who've kind of done that? But if I had it in my calendar, then I would know that this big project is coming up and these are all the things that are needed to make sure that I'm prepared. Uh, for doing that, all right? So, setting deadlines. It says deadlines, but I don't like deadlines because if you don't get it done, nobody's gonna die. Sometimes we think we are. I was talking to a friend on the phone the other day and her son came in and said, I've gotta get, I'm supposed to be at an event. And she's on the phone, we we're having a Zoom call, and I've gotta be there, and if I don't get there, and she's like, hold it. First of all, I have nothing on my calendar regarding anything you're talking about. Well, I told dad. Well, he ain't here. <laughs> so maybe when he gets home, he can take care of it. But I gotta be there now. I think I'm on a call right now. <laughs> so when I get off my call, then I'll address you. But it was for him, it was a deadline. But I like saying setting timelines because timelines mean that they can be shifted, they can be adjusted. Deadlines mean that if I don't do it right now, it's, it's done, it's over. Everybody's gonna die and we, it's all over. Now there may be a time for that, but not, not for stuff on our calendars and stuff. But setting timelines, writing them down, giving yourself, now what I do like about electronics is that I can set reminders. So I set reminders, bless you. I set reminders to tell me I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be there. I'm supposed to turn this in. I'm supposed to do that. See, that's my phone now telling me something. See, I have an alarm, 6.45, but I don't have that meeting today. So, cause I'm here with you but I have those types of alarms that will go off. That was perfect timing. <laughs> wow. Um, that will go off to tell me where I'm supposed to be. So if I have appointments and things of that nature, I will set alarms so that I'll know. I won't be late for them. So I don't set the alarm for when I'm supposed to be there. I set the alarm ahead of time so I can make sure that I'm there when I'm supposed to be there. So that's the one nice thing about electronics is to use it for that purpose, 
but I also then have it written down so then I can see what all the detail is about it. Pad your deadlines or timelines a little bit. Now, in your, um, in your booklet that you, that you have, understanding time management, at the top it says the basic element of time is what? The basic element of time is, <clears throat> say it again. Mm, no. It's an event. The basic element of time is an event. E-V-E-N-T. Okay. Everything we do is an event. If I have a, an, a meeting, that's an event. If I have an appointment, that's an event. So everything is an event. So what's the other uh, space that says, the key to managing time is, what do you think? Almost, event control. Event control. Who's in charge of your schedule? You are, you are. So your ability to manage time is managing your events and being in control of those events. So if you double book, whose fault is that? Yeah, it's yours. Or if you don't give yourself from one event to the next event, that means you're gonna be late for one or the other. So the idea is that in order, you can't stop the clock, you don't get any more time, and as of November, if they stick with it, we won't be turning the clock back and we won't be moving it forward in the spring, okay? So you won't get an extra hour or lose an hour. We'll see if our, our congressmen stick to what they voted on. But the idea is you don't get any extra time. You got 24 hours a day, and that's all you get. So in that, you've got to look at how do I manage all of the events in that time period? So you got to have time in there to sleep. You got to have time in there to eat. Students, you got to have time when you're at school. You can't do anything else but what's happening right then and there. So what we have a tendency to do is stack everything on top of each other and think we can be three people. Now you are, me, myself, and I, <laughs> but you can't divide that up, so therefore, you have to look at, I can't be across town and then be at this event at the same time. Some of us think we can, and then you are like the, the ones that are driving crazy, trying to get to that next event, okay? So you need to look at, maybe I can only spend an hour here and maybe 30 minutes here or whatever, but you've got to manage that and do it in a way that's going to allow you to be as effective as you possibly can. So in that, in that packet where it talks about, um, let me pull that packet. Time management is the fact that we cannot manage time, but we can manage events that are happening. And our ability to do that is uh, to take into consideration what is available to us. But let's talk a little bit about sometimes some time wasters. <clears throat> any of us do any of this? <laughs> Students, any of you? <laughs> how many of you don't know how to say no? <laughs> no. <laughs> and then at, at, at the end of the day, you look at it and say, 
Why did I just say I could do that? Or why did I agree to take that on? But this excessively checking email, they're all going to be there. We're going to talk about how you manage your emails. How about coping with things outside of your control? There are many things in life that we cannot control. If you get sick or whatever, that means that your schedule is potentially going to be altered. You can't go to work. You can't go to school. You can't participate in sports. You can't go on that vacation, whatever the case may be. Uh, so adjusting to that or weather conditions is that we were going to move and all of a sudden now it is raining and there's just no way that we can, all of our stuff is going to get soaked. So we always need to have a backup plan for different situations. That eliminates stress when we have a backup plan. So you should always have a plan A, a plan B, and sometimes a plan C. So then you don't get frustrated. Oh, plan A didn't work, okay. What's B? B doesn't seem like it's coming along. Okay, let's go to plan C. That eliminates your stressors, because when you get stressed, that impacts your ability to stay focused, to stay organized, and to really get things done. Because you, you just throw your arms up in the air or you just say nothing's gonna work out. To-do lists, let's talk a little bit about to-do lists. Sometimes we think to-do list means what? putting everything down that we could ever think of. That is not a to-do list. Today is what? Thursday. Today is Thursday. How many of you created a to-do list for Thursday? Or how many of you created a to-do list for the whole week? And today is Thursday. How many items on that list got done? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Always got to have a brown noser in the crowd. <laughs> so many of us create a laundry list. That is not a to-do list. A to-do list is focused on what I can get done today. If I know I'm at school from eight in the morning until three o'clock, then that means from that time period, there's nothing else that can be done but going to school. When I get out at three o'clock, now let's talk about, I've got sports, I've got a club, I've got homework, I've got chores. What does the rest of the evening look like from three o'clock until whatever time you're scheduled to go to bed, students. Then you plan your calendar that way. In that should be projects that you're working on or assignments that you have. Therefore, you know that on Thursday, I've got my major project that's due on Monday, so I'm going to start on it tonight and I'm going to do at least 30 minutes of that project. And then on Friday, I'm going to do another 30 minutes. And on Saturday, I'm going to finish it up. So on Monday, I'm ready to go. I'm not doing it on Sunday night at midnight. I know some of us love to work under pressure. I do my best work under pressure. But is, it that, is that really your best work? In many cases, our best work is when we can reflect on what we've already done. We can tweak it and make sure that we've got the best pieces and parts all put together. Uh, my daughter Danielle says that procrastination is her friend and she likes to have her friend with her at all times. 
and she's always waiting till the last minute to do stuff. And then I don't help her anymore. Because if you want to wait till the last minute, um, I have other priorities and therefore you've got to stay up all night and do it all by yourself. But I'll see you in the morning. I'm going to bed. <laughs> and I think parents, when you do that enough to your students, they will not, procrastination will not be their friend. They will start to get things done in a, in a timely manner. So using a day planner. Ooh. This is probably blocking it. If it goes out, we'll talk without it. How about that? But we'll see. Okay. I have these papers there, so. Using a day planner, that can be your calendar or whatever you want to use it. It should be something you're using every day. Every day you're adding something to it. So one of the things uh, that I do is I have a big planner. I have an eight and a half by 11 planner. And every day I put my devotional in there. I put all my appointments for that day. So I put my calendar for the whole week in there. But in terms of daily task or whatever, I always want to reflect back on, did I miss something yesterday that I had planned to do that needs to be on today's calendar? So I'm always going to do a reflection. How many of you are morning people? Okay. So in most cases, morning people should do their planning in the morning because your thought processes are better. If you are an evening person, then you want to do your planning before you go to bed because you're an evening person. So that's where your energy and so forth um, is. But for those that are morning, you want to do it first thing in the morning. As you're thinking about it, your mind is fresh or whatever. Evening people wait till the evening before you go to bed, plan out what your day is going to be. But you always want to reflect and say, did I accomplish everything yesterday that I wanted to accomplish? And if not, am I going to do it tomorrow? If you know you're not going to do it tomorrow, then don't put it on tomorrow. That's again a laundry list. Put it on whatever day it is that you know you're going to work on it. Or how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time if you choose to eat an elephant. But an elephant is big. It's daunting. So I'm going to break an elephant into small bites. So I'm going to do 15 minutes today, 15 minutes two days from now, 15 minutes a couple of days later, because I'm not going to eat that elephant all in one setting. And I'm not going to put that on my calendar and say, I'm going to spend three hours working on this assignment. <laughs> three hours later, nothing has been done on that assignment, but I got a lot of sleep because that's what we end up doing is falling asleep when we give unrealistic time frames to completing projects. Okay. And this is the big one. Finish what you start. I love to give myself rewards. <laughs> I reward myself all the time. If you finish this, you can go and have that chocolate bar that's been waiting for you. <laughs> I'm going to finish. You can go have you a scoop of ice cream, but you got to finish. So that's, I reward myself because I want to be saying, I accomplished, check, check, I got that done. There's a new reward for this and for that. But you want to think at, finish what you start, that accomplishment, that positive feeling, and do that. Encourage your scholars to do the same thing. Give them a project to start. Encourage them to finish it. And even if it's hard, oh, I can't do this. Come on, let's spend two more minutes and let's finish it up. Look at what you've done. If we waited, then we wouldn't see completion. So you want to encourage them. It saves time and then you miss all the squirrels. 
You don't have the squirrels chasing you because you've actually finished what needed to be done. All right, let's go back to our organization piece of it as well. Paper and paperless storage. So we've all got papers all around. My mother keeps every receipt from everything. And I asked her why she keeps them. She said, because I might want to return it. Well, you've had it for about five years now. I don't think you're going to return that item. Do you even know where that item is? Well, some of my items still have tags on them. I said, yeah, I noticed that, which probably means you're never going to wear it either. Well, I never know when I might need those receipts. Okay, mother. Old receipts, invoices, cards, old letters, just digitize it. Take a picture of it, upload it to the cloud, and get rid of the paper. That's an easy way to get rid of those kind of things. We're living in a paperless society, so everything can be done electronically. I know some of us don't like the electronic paying my bills that way, because what if they don't get it? I want to send them a check, and then I have a copy of that check. You don't have to keep those either because the bank keeps them. So you can go back to them at any, at any time. So now we don't really have excuses for lots of paper, other than the fact that we just don't know how to throw things away. Okay? Who has a clean desk? Who works at a clean desk? Okay. And how do you make it clean? Either. Okay. So we put things away that we're not using. So that means that I'm working on one project at a time, or I have files that I put information in. So that's the piece in terms of keeping things organize. Do it, delegate it, file it, or dump it. That's the order. Do it, delegate it, means somebody else needs to be doing it. File it, because it is something that I need to refer back to at a later time, or dump it. And for those of you who struggle with that, get you a paper shredder. And so once you shred it, you can't go back and get it. Just go back, just shred it. And therefore it's gone. I know some of you would be like, uh, mm, mm, mm. but just shred it and then it's gone. Unless you're really crazy and you're gonna take the stuff out of the shredder and tape it back together. <laughs> Hopefully not, okay? Hopefully not. All right. Check it off your list. If you're doing stuff electronically, you can do that electronically. So you can finish, you can actually tell it, I want it to remind me on this date, it'll pop back up, you can work on it, and then you can put completion on it and be done with it. All right, so on the tables, I think most of the tables, there was a syllabus. Okay. I think two tables didn't have a syllabus, but you guys can turn around and, and maybe share it. On that, yes. So, what is a syllabus for? Hmm? So, yes. Okay, so helps you to know expectations. What else? Hmm? It's a mission. Okay. What else? What is the syllabus for? Why do, why do teachers give students syllabus or outlines? So knowing what projects that you have, but it's a contract. It's a contract, knowing expectations. So when you get a syllabus or a course outline, it typically is going to tell you what books are going to be read. Um, it's going to tell you what assignments are coming up. It's going to tell you what the rules of the class might be and the expectations 
uh, that need to happen, but it's a contract between the teacher and the student. And in our work environments, we have job descriptions, which you can call a contract as well, that says, this is what I'm gonna be expecting of you to accomplish. Well, when you begin to look at that, that is your way of really organizing what needs to happen for you in that particular class or that particular project, whatever the case may be. A lot of times schools will send these home and they will ask parents to sign off on them. The whole purpose or premise behind that is you then are saying, we agree with what's on here and we're gonna hold our scholar accountable for meeting that expectation. So parents, if you're signing this and you're not reading it, that's a problem. Because there may be something on here that you don't want to agree to or that you're not able to follow. And those of you who homeschool, you should have contracts too with your scholars. So they know exactly, these are the expectations, this is what we're agreeing to, and this is how we're gonna to work together because that's what these are for. So if you've gotten your outlines, your course outlines or syllabus from, your, from, the, from the school or as uh, parents and you're doing homeschooling, please make sure that you check this. And what are the specifics? And if there are things that you believe should be in the contract or should be part of the expectations, then that's a conversation that you should have with the child's teacher. Therefore, you're on the same page. So if the teacher says, we're going to do X, Y, Z, or these are how, this is how we're gonna grade, or this is how we're gonna post work in Infinite Campus or whatever the online portals may be, then that's what I'm gonna hold the teacher accountable for. And our middle and high school students should be holding their teachers accountable for meeting the contract because that's what this is. That's the agreement. The agreement is that in order for me to pass this class, I'm gonna do these things, I'm gonna meet these expectations, I know what the absences are, the makeup work, I know what time the class is, I know the grading scale and policies, and if I do those things and do them well, then I should do well in this class. So parents, my question to you is, do you know what the contracts are for the classes that your scholars are taking? Are you aware? Did you sign off on it, but you didn't read it? And are there things missing from that contract that you believe should be in there in order for that to have that good relationship between teacher and parent and then student. All of that information that's on that contract should be in the planner. This is when our tests are. This is when our projects are due. This is when our papers that we're writing are due. This is when we're going on a field trip, especially for our little ones. Little ones probably don't have a course outline, but the teacher probably provides information on what their schedule and, and expectations are. Please make sure you have that information and you're clear about what the expectations are. It's kind of hard to meet expectations that you don't know. And it's hard to hold our uh, scholars accountable when we don't know what they're accountable for. So that's all part of this piece in terms of when we talk about the desk, I know I'm talking about the desk piece now, but really making sure that we're setting ourselves up for success. Scholars, do you have a place at home where you work, where you do your work? Not sitting on your bed, but do you have a place that you work? Parents, if not, they need to have a place where they can work. Their space 
and their bed is not the place for it, not the couch, not the comfy chair, <laughs> okay? But a place that's clear, clean for them to keep their projects, their work, their assignments, a wall calendar or whatever, uh, or a calendar so that they can keep track of their assignments and so forth. And especially at the middle and high school, because they got so much stuff going on. Kids are in sports, kids are in clubs. They got act after school activities. They're participating in this, participating in that. You need a calendar to track all of that information. Okay. Questions? All right, let's talk a little bit about procrastination. You want to see me tomorrow? <laughs> Procrastination can be a motivator, but not when it overwhelms you. So sometimes you can get a spark of energy and a spark of genius when you procrastinate, but not when it becomes a pattern, a daily pattern. It leads to disorganization and uh, lack of time management. And it also just causes a lot of stress. So Mark Twain said, we wanna learn how to eat a live frog every morning and nothing worse will happen to you the rest of the day. Now, I don't know if you wanna do that but the idea is that, you know, with a frog, it hops along, so you'll be hopping all day, getting stuff done, so you won't procrastinate anymore. <laughs> but you wanna think about, how do I make sure that things don't get undone or not be done? One is that you wanna look at internal and external time wasters. So in that packet that you have, I think it's in there. And this is just a resource packet for you, so I'm not gonna go through all of this, but if you turn to, and there's no page number. One, there's uh, something on here that says nine ways to overcome procrastination. So delete it, delegate it, do it now, ask for advice, chop it up, obey the 15 minute rule, have clear deadlines or timelines, give yourself a reward, remove distractions. So I've already talked about those. On that back page of that, it talks about um, managing interruptions, but internal and external, these are uh, distractions that sometimes get in our way. So if you begin to look at that list, it looks like this. I want you to circle on the first list three things that are externally imposed upon you that cause you to procrastinate or to cause you not to get things done. And then three things on the other side that are internally generated uh, that you struggle with. So three things on the left side and then three things on the right side. Just circle those. Three things on the left side and three things on the right side.
How many of you had number four on the left side? Other people's deadlines. So how do you change that? Yeah. So you have to put some expectations on them. Is I understand that you need this tomorrow. <laughs> I should have known maybe yesterday when I had some extra time. So now you need to figure out what you're going to do. Maybe you have to tell your teacher you're not going to have that assignment in tomorrow. Because the stores are closed. I'm tired. Your siblings got, you know, things that they did schedule. So other people's deadlines should not become your priority. That's right. But we make it. We make it ours. How about... Is the telephone an interruption for you guys? How so, Tiffany? <laughs> but should that be an interruption for you? <laughs> That's right. Got caller ID. My girls say all the time, I be calling you and you don't answer. And I've called you three times. I'm like, OK. I, it could have been an emergency, but it wasn't. You just wanted me then because you had something that you needed an answer to right away. And you expected me to drop everything to respond. But we do that. And as long as we keep doing it, we'll always be doing it. So I just let the phone go to voicemail. Leave me a message. Leave me a message and I'll get back to you. And then come to find out it wasn't important anyway. Because they'll say, well, I needed you then and now I don't need it at all. Oh, huh, you figured it out. Mm, what a concept. I love that. Taught you to be a decision maker. Using your brain. I love it. How about on the right side? What's one that's really stood out for, for you? Which one? Number four, trying to do too much. Okay. So we've got to learn how to look at our time available. Does anybody have more than 24 hours a day? You do? Me too. <laughs> I work in my sleep. So if you know that it's going to, but I think number four ties to number three. Unrealistic time estimations to do a job or to do a project. And that's why we want to look at the amount of time that it, uh, it's taking us. No system of self-accountability. Got to take ownership for our own stuff. So one way to start doing this is to look at managing your workflow, selecting a task, timing yourself. So when I do projects, I give myself a time frame. So I will say, I am going to work on this for 20 minutes and I set the clock and at 20 minutes, no matter where I am in it, I stop and I then go on to the next project. Now I might come back to it, but I stop at that 20 minutes because already my mind is working towards that 20 minutes. And frankly, when I get to that 20 minutes, I want to stop because I keep looking saying, oh, 20 minutes up yet, 20 minutes up yet. But set times for yourself. Ignore everything else. This eliminates the squirrels. Because if the 20 minutes isn't up, you really shouldn't be working on anything else but what you said you were going to work on. That's hard. But when you start doing that enough, then you start completing stuff. 
things get organized, schedules get mastered, and projects get completed. No breaks or interruptions until you finish. So don't set, eh, I'm gonna work on this for two hours. No, you're not. How long is the adult attention span? Two minutes. Our attention span is shorter than children's attention span. Why? Because we have so much stuff running through our head. I gotta go do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do, I gotta do this. How many of you get up in the morning and before you can put your feet down, you already got 10 things that you need to get done? And what happens is the stuff that you really need to get done, don't get done. Because what you slept last night and rolled around in your head, those things get done and not the things that are on your list. Prioritize. And then give yourself that award. Just quickly, this one, you've got it in your handout, organizing your inbox. How many of you have more than 30 messages in your inbox? <laughs> Not good. What does that cause you to do? Scroll, scroll, scroll. You just keep going through them. Do them, file them, delegate them, or dump them. You shouldn't have more than 30 messages in your email that you're working. If it's something that you need to come back to, put it in a file, put a date when it will remind you that it needs to be done and it'll pop back up and you'll say, oh, okay, I still need to do this. But if you keep it in your inbox, then you're constantly scrolling through your inbox, trying to get through all of the messages that are in there. Look at it and say, am I gonna do it? Should I give it to somebody else? Should it be filed or let me delete it? When you have more than 30 in your inbox, that's a, that's a bad, that is not an organization of your inbox. So set up files for yourself. These are family emails. These are work emails. This is related to this project. And then just put timers on it to say, I wanted this to come back in two months because I'm not going to work on it now, but I, wanna, I don't want to get rid of it yet. Okay? But declutter your uh, inbox. Again, same thing. Immediate action. If not, do something with it. Okay. Let's talk about some of these things in terms of getting organized. Time logs, how many of you are familiar with time logs? Okay, so a time log, and I don't know if I have one in here. Time log is where I'm gonna look at my day and I'm gonna do it maybe over the course of a week and I'm gonna block uh, off half an hour increments for that day and then I'm going to time to see how much time am I spending on this, on this, so the whole day. So I'm going from you know, midnight to midnight and I'm gonna track exactly what I do every 30 minutes. And I'm gonna do that for a whole week. Then I can begin to look at that and say, where am I wasting time? Where am I being most productive? And how am I managing appointments or schedules or whatever the case may be. So when you do a time log like that, what that then allows you to see is where are you being, where are you spending your time? Are you spending it on urgent and not important type things? Or are you spending it on maybe not urgent, but important like goal setting, managing your time, making sure that you've got good schedules and so forth? Or am I spending it, am I scrolling, watching TV? Where are you spending your time? And track it every 30 minutes. What have I been doing for the last 30 minutes? 
And when you began to look at that, you're saying, oh, my goodness, I did not realize that I'm spending this much time on Facebook. I didn't realize I'm spending this much time, whatever the case may be. And that then allows you to become more productive and say, I need to spend less time here. So students, the same thing. When it's time to do your homework, are you spending tons of time trying to gather everything or clean off the space? Or are you able to get right into whatever the project or the assignment is? But do that for about a week and you'll begin to then look at shifting where you're spending your time. That's what a time log is. Block time is where I am going to put this time away to do this. And that's all I'm gonna do. So when I read books, I don't read, I can't read, a, I can't sit down and just read a book. I know some people do, they just read, a, they can read a novel in a whole week. That doesn't work for me because uh, that's where the squirrels come for me. So I will say every day I put in my calendar 30 minutes and I'm gonna read something. And so every day my alarm will click at nine o'clock and from nine to 9.30, if I'm not in an appointment, I then read part of a, a book that I'm trying to get through. Therefore, I'm a lot more productive. I actually remember what I've read <laughs> uh, because I have it scheduled. So that's what block time is, is I'm gonna block some time to do it. So those of you that are gonna organize your garage, <laughs> You're gonna block time every Saturday for maybe a half an hour, and I'm gonna work on this section of the garage, and then you'll see how you're able to get it done. So for that 30 minutes, you do nothing else but work on that organizing, or work on that project, or work on that assignment, whatever it is, but you block the time. Therefore, it's like you being in, having an appointment with somebody. When you have an appointment with somebody, you don't do other stuff. That's what block time is. If I'm in the doctor's office, I'm there at the appointment. I can't do other stuff. So that's, I'm blocking that time and that's all I'm gonna focus on. Batch task is that, this is for those of you who spend a lot of time on your technology, either doing Facebook or, or Instagram or any of those is to batch your task and say, I am going to spend an hour doing all of my social media, responding to emails, blah, 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 and I'm gonna do that twice a day. And therefore, I don't respond outside of that. How many of you, every time your phone dings, you, you're responding? How productive is that? In many cases, not very productive. So think about it and say, I'm at work. During this time and this time, I can't be checking my emails. I can't check my social media. I can't check my whatever. And I block that, I batch all of that together, but I'm gonna do it all at this time. And then I get it done. Then I'm much more efficient with it because if I'm doing it every time I hear a ding, in many cases, I'm never finishing it. I'm checking it. I don't delegate it, I don't do it, I don't trash it, and then it's still sitting there when I go back to it an hour later. So batching is I put everything together. Your priority list, that's your to-do list. A, B, C, priority. A says everything that I say is an A must be done today. B says if I finish the A's, I'll work on the B's. And C's are, they're trivial. If I get to them, it's okay. What we need to do is sometimes make a C and A because we need some feel goods. So I need to be able to check something off the list. The A's are hard. So I put a C on there so I can check it off and say, yes, I got something done today. But your C's are typically things that you don't necessarily need to get done. But if, I, if everything else works out the way I would like them to, I can maybe get to the C's. Productivity journal, how many of you journal? The productivity journal is one where you can really track your productivity to determine are you getting things done that are important to you? 
So if you've got a big goal or whatever that you have set for yourself, your ability to track how well are you accomplishing that goal, working towards that. Because if you don't set a time, a date, a time frame, it's just a dream. It's just a dream. So it's not a goal. Goals have our smart goals, and I think that's in your packet. Smart goals is gonna be specific, I can measure it, it's attainable, it's results oriented, and it has a time frame to it. So if you really wanna accomplish something and look at your productivity, then you gotta say, have I set some real specific measurements about it? I say all the time, I wanna to go to Germany, but I haven't set a time frame. I don't know how much it costs, I don't know where I wanna go in Germany, but it just sounds really fun. So it's just a dream that I've had for a long time. And I still haven't planned for it yet. This is just a fun one. Oh, that time log is in there. I saw I'm ahead of myself. Chunk, block, and tackle. This is like eating the elephant. I'm gonna chunk it, I'm gonna block it, and I'm gonna tackle it. So you wanna think about it that from that. So take this elephant, I'm gonna make the smaller pieces, I'm gonna block it, and then I'm gonna, when I block it, that means I'm gonna tackle it and get rid of it. So you do have the time log in there. Okay. And the time log can be related to your quadrants, which we talked about already. Urgent and important, important but not urgent. So you can actually tie your time log to that. So as part of your time log, once you go through it, you can say, how much of quadrant one did I do today? How much of quadrant two did I do today? How much of quadrant three, where should I be spending my time? That allows you to measure that out. Okay, here's some, uh, just uh, four effective strategies. Make time to plan, that's quadrant number two. It's urgent, but it's not important. But if I'm going to accomplish the things that I need to accomplish, I need to spend time in quadrant number two. Be realistic. Sometimes we're not realistic with ourselves. We try to do too much and we put too much on our calendars and it's just not gonna happen. Learn how to delegate. That means we say no. Learn how to assign. That means we say no and then stop procrastinating. So let's look at 10 strategies or 10 mistakes. We don't do a to-do list, okay? We've already talked about a to-do list again. Prioritize that to-do list, A, B, and C. A's I'm gonna get done today because they are important and I said I need to get them done not setting personal goals. We can have work goals, but what are some personal goals? So even for students, what are some of their personal goals? What are some things that are important to them that they want to achieve? And how are they working towards that? Getting good grades in school, yes, that's a goal. But beyond that, what are some other things that are important to them that they wanna to work towards? Because those are motivators. See, when we have personal goals, connected to the things that we have to do, those are motivators for us. That gives us the ability to say, ah, oh, I can do this. Learning how to prioritize and sticking to it. This is the hard part. That's why you give yourself time. I'm only gonna do this for 20 minutes. I'm only gonna do this for 30 minutes. I'm only gonna do this for 10 minutes because I can't do any more than that. When we begin to do that, then it makes it much easier to get things done. Learn how to manage distractions and realize the ones that are yours, meaning in your own space, your own head, and then the ones that you allow others to impose upon you. Okay. Just do it. <laughs> if you have it in front of you, just do it. Don't not focus on it. Taking on too much 
learn how to say no. Or sometimes learn how to say not now. So you can sometimes say, I do want to do that, or I do want to help them with that, but not now. Maybe in a month, maybe in a year, <laughs> but you do want to do it, but you just can't do it right now, okay? Some of us thrive on being busy. You know what that means? It's a virtue. <laughs> But some of us thrive on, we just want to be busy. We don't know why, but we just want to be busy. Huh? Sometimes it makes us feel good. Or it makes us feel valuable. Or it makes us feel useful. But when we do that, how effective are we on the things that need to be done? How many of us are building relationships? So not just doing stuff but building relationships with people. That takes time. You just can't do that like that. So when we just become so busy, yeah, we feel good that, you know, everybody wants me to be involved in this and do this and do this. But are you okay with that? So a lot of people always say to me, you're on a lot of boards. Well, I am but I'm only on the ones that I choose to be on. I get asked to be on a lot of board, other boards, but they have no interest to me. So the things that you're involved in, do you, are you involved in them because they mean something to you or are you doing it because you believe other people expect you to? Because when you do that, are you giving it your all? Are you giving it 100%? In many cases, you're not because you have no passion for it. You have no interest in it. So it sucks up a lot of time and energy and effort. And at the end of the day, you're like, why am I doing that? So just think about that in terms of thriving on busy. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what? I'm good. You do you. I'm going home. So one of the things I said is that in my, I read in my bio, I like to put together puzzles. And I haven't done a lot of puzzles lately because I have my daughter's cat in my house and the cat would destroy my puzzles and walk all over them and mix them. And I'm like, really? <laughs> uh, but I love doing that because with puzzles, you have a picture, you know what it's supposed to look like, but until you do it, you can't see the whole thing. And so I love to do that because I love to see it finished. And when I finish the puzzles, I don't tear them apart and put them back in the box. That's too much work. I glue them and put them in a frame and give them away. Because after all of them, putting them 500 pieces, 1,000 pieces together, somebody needs the benefit of being able to have that on their wall. <laughs> but just think about, what are the things that I really enjoy doing that I don't spend the time doing? So I have a puzzle at work and I tell them that every day they have to do at least two pieces of this puzzle. Now, Melissa is, a, is an achiever, so she just... She does a whole lot more than three pieces or two pieces. But we've just got this and it's, it's just fun and can't stop. This is a really, when I finish this puzzle, I have to show you guys because it's a pretty, pretty interesting puzzle. But the idea is find time to do stuff that you enjoy. Doesn't matter whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes. What is it that you enjoy that you're not doing now? Find the time to do it. Prioritize it. Give yourself permission. Students, give yourself permission to do that as well. Now, ladies, we say we can multitask. That is not true. 
whatever. You, we can do lots of stuff, but in terms of our ability to listen and to think and to process, your mind can only focus on one thing at a time. So I might be able to mop the floor, hold the baby and stir the pan, but I can't talk to you because I'm so focused on doing that stuff. And the kids are saying, mom, mom. And I'm like, yeah, I heard you. What did we say? I don't know. So it must not have been important. But a lot of times I say, I heard you. They say, well, repeat it to us. And I really can't. I don't know what they said. <laughs> so we think we can multitask, but we can't. Because the, something, the floor ain't mopped right, the baby's crying, and the pan, the stuff is burning. Okay. So you want to just stop, do one thing, finish it, start the next thing, do it, and go from there. And some of us say, well, I, I got babies grabbing all onto my skirt and my jacket and, my, and they're talking to me. I get it. But a lot of times we're going to miss whatever needs to be done because multitasking is a false component of uh, being able to manage time and not taking breaks, time out. Give yourself time out. I know when my kids were younger, I used to give myself lots of uh, breaks because I tell them, mommy needs a time out. Because you guys are getting on my nerves. <laughs> I don't do it as much now, but I, I'm an empty nester now, so it doesn't matter. But the idea is take time for a break. I always used to say, you know, people who smoke, nothing against them, but they always take breaks. They take a break in the morning. They take a break in the afternoon. So I used to take breaks with the smokers. I didn't smoke, but I, if they could take a break and still get their work done, then why can't I stop and take a break? So do that. Take a break. Take time. Those of you that don't work or whatever, take a break from whatever it is that you're doing at home. Washing clothes and, and cleaning the house and all of that. Take a break. Everybody needs a break. And then the last one, make sure that your, your schedules, you're not double booking yourself. You're not all over the place. And the way to coordinate that is sit down with your scholars, look at those syllabuses or course outlines, match that against your work schedules, match that against your family schedule, and make sure that, yeah, we can do all these things. And sometimes even with your scholars, you might have to say, I'm sorry, but you can't do basketball and baseball and hockey and volleyball all at the same time. You just can't do it because your other sibling wants to do some of those same things. So you sometimes have to say no to your scholars that pick a sport or pick a season because you can't do it all. We can't be everywhere at the same time. And I know that's hard sometimes, but you've got to pick and choose with everything else that your family may be doing. So here's your assignment before you leave today. What will you start doing? What will you stop doing? Or what will you do differently to get yourself organized and manage your time effectively? So write that down. Something you're gonna start doing something you're going to stop doing, and something that you're going to do differently to manage your time or to organize yourself. So this table share with this table, this table share with that table, this table share with that table, these two tables you share, those two tables you share, and those two tables you share. Just share something either you're going to stop doing, start doing, or do differently. Just share one of them. You don't have to share all three. All right. Let's come back together. Five, four, three, two, one. Nothing changes until you decide you're going to change. Nothing gets organized, no management of our schedules until you decide that it's too painful to continue doing it the way we've been doing it. You have to have a mindset shift and you have to be willing to start small. Again, 
Don't try to do it all at one time because then you're just gonna say, this is why I don't organize because it's too hard or it's too much. Small chunks. Chunk, block, and tackle. And this is a quote I always use because a mentor of mine just uh, always reminded you that if you want to do something, you'll find a way. And if you don't, you'll find an excuse. So if you want to change how things are organized or how, you're, how you manage the events in your life, then you have to decide today is the day to begin that process. Don't make an excuse because you're the only one who can make the change happen. Thank you for being here this evening.